Thank you so much, Danae. Um, all right, so welcome again to part two of Measuring Love in the Journey to End Sexual and Intimate Partner Violence. Um, this is a, a Prevent Connect web conference, and Prevent Connect is a national project of Valor US, sponsored by the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views and information provided in this web conference do not necessarily represent the official views of the US government, CDC, or Valor. And once again, my name is Ashley, and I'm so thrilled to be here and have you all here to engage in this conversation. Um, I, let's see, I seem to have lost my um, control, Janae, to move the slides. <laughs> so if you could help me move to the yeah, next slide, I'd appreciate sure. that. Sure, yeah. Thank you. Oh, it's back. All right, thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to start before I introduce you to our presenters and um, we got into the conversation. I've been thinking a lot about the conversations and some of the questions that came up in the first session of this series. And I think I've been thinking about the tendency for me um, and, and maybe for some of you too, but definitely I tend to overthink a lot of this. <laughs> and, you know, it makes a lot of sense because I think we're used to overthinking in our work um, because we have to. We're dealing with something that's really complex. Uh, if I told you how long I thought about what a technical package was, you would be absolutely amazed. <laughs> but it, it took me so long because that language just didn't make sense to me, right? And when I finally saw what it was, I was like, oh, this is just a resource of strategies and approaches. So anyways, I, I think a lot of the language and terminology that we use in our prevention work is, is complex, but the concept of love is actually so accessible. Um, but, it, but it's a shift, right? It's a shift for us to talk about love in a space like this. Um, but what I see is so many of, of you all specifically practicing love in your work. I think about community connectedness and social cohesion. Is that not a measure of love? I think about creating protective environments. Like there has to be an element of love in that work. I also think about something that I've heard Father Greg Boyle from Homeboy Industries say. He says that our goal in life is to love each other into wholeness. And that made me really think about health equity. Isn't that what health equity promises us, wholeness? everyone having what they need to be able to reach their full potential. I've been reflecting a lot on how love shows up in my work. And, you know, believe it or not, like this is such a small thing, but the practice of us opening up the Zoom room a few minutes before we're supposed to start to, to welcome people and to ask, you know, to, to hear from you all, that is a really small way that we try to intentionally infuse love and practice love because I truly am happy that you're here and I want people to feel seen and feel appreciated, even in the confines of a Zoom room. So I, I'm inviting us all into a conversation today to recognize all the ways that love is already a part of your prevention work and to imagine additional places for love. And for us to think, where do we each have power to lead with love? Um, another thing that Father, Father Boyle said in one of his books is that systems change when people change. And that love is the answer, community is the context, and tenderness is the methodology. And I really think that fits so well into what we are doing here. So um, I, I'm just, you know, thrilled that you're here for this conversation. It's a different conversation than we're used to having in our, you know, um, CDC funded prevention work. Uh, I also thought this, this uh, quote from Collective Change Lab really spoke to me that, that how can we transform systems where that is our work, right? To, to change systems, but, but systems are made up of people. So we have to change ourselves um, in order to do that. And so that's what we invite us all to think about in this space. Um, and with that, uh, our presenters have some incredible objectives for us in, in looking at the differences between shame and guilt, discussing how composting shame, and I just love this, this 
uh, idea of composting shame in the context of the Measuring Love framework. We'll be looking at what, what, what love looks like in practice, hearing about a demonstration project based off the Measuring Love framework, and then again, considering our power and our space in um, in our own work. So with that, I am so honored to introduce you all again to Dr. Audrey Jordan and Sheree Tang. And um, Audrey, I'll pass it over to you. We'd love to just say hello to you and Sheree, and thank you for being here with us today. Wow. Ashley, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and for the sort of container you helped create for what we're up to today. Hello, everybody. It's great to see you. I am Audrey Jordan, um, the founder of ADJ Consulting and Coaching, uh, pronoun she, her, hers. I um, am following up today, as Ashley and Janae already intimated, uh, with the second of three sessions that my fabulous partner, Cherie Tang, and I are doing um, for this series. Um, the last time, well, well, let me say, uh, uh, well, let me say a few things, and then I'll introduce myself and ask Cherie to do the same. I'll just say that um, the last time Cherie led this session and focused us on our self journey to being in integrity with our values, boundaries and all. Are we who we say we are? What are our stories of the journey to becoming our authentic selves? The Measuring Love Framework pushes us to be much more conscious and intentional about being agents of the change we say we want to be in the world. That person we all know we are, much of the time, not all of the time, <laughs> with honesty, vulnerability, and intentionality, we believe we can be. So in this session, I'm going to take some time to lead us through some ways we can work on that honesty, vulnerability, and intentionality using the framework as grounding. We'll share with each other through the chat and in a breakout session. And I'll share some key learnings from the paper and from a demonstration project I was privileged to be able to do in Memphis, Tennessee last summer and continue to do actually with those folks and others. And we'll leave with some, hopefully leave you with some ways you can do this work or at least practice it in your own spheres. Importantly, I want you to know that we read the, we read the chat from the last session and I very much appreciate the honesty and vulnerability that I saw and I know Cherie saw too. And so many of the comments, folk stories about their journeys to self. Sheree and I and our team developed the framework so that we could make sense of the work we know we need to do. And we're inviting others to do the same. We don't have prescriptions, formulas, how-to manuals. You have to do your own work just as we are doing our work. And we hope that we'll be providing you with enough knowledge, insights, and scaffolding so that you can go on your continued journey. Um, let me say a little about myself. Um, I am <laughs> retired now, but semi-retired really. I'm one of those people who will never stop working because I feel an urgency to continue to be relevant in this movement for change. Um, I see myself as an elder, not an older, as Cherie talked about last time hopefully meaning that I'm not just this old person who has stuff to say, but take it or leave it, right? But an elder who can deserve and earn the respect of co-sojourners who it's their time on stage and I can support and learn with them. I have been in academia, philanthropy. I've been a consultant and a coach. I just retired from teaching at an online university 
that does master's degrees in public administration and other kinds of professional studies. And I led the DEI work while I was at um, Claremont Lincoln University here in Claremont. I'm in Southern California in San Bernardino County and just thrilled to be here and share with you all and continue this really, really important work with my partner, Cherie Tang. Cherie, let me invite you in to say a little bit about yourself and your intention for today. Mm, thank you, Audrey, Ashley, Janae. Thank you everyone for joining today. I want to invite us all to a deep breath to welcome in the day from the belly. So if you are willing, if it's comfortable, accessible, please join me. Deep breath into our bellies. <sighs> and a big sigh out. Let's do that two more times together, all right? Here we go. <sighs> One more. Ah, awesome. Thank you so much. I greet you with the sun in Oakland, California, Ohlone Land Territory. And uh, we're still here. We're still here. We're still here fighting the good fight and living a life that's worth living. So really thrilled to be on this radical love journey with you all. This is not the normal kind of, you know, love for self talk that encourages us to take time to have a glass of wine or go get our nails done. We call that self-soothing and it is very important. Yet we are here to invite you onto a journey of radical love for self. Like Audrey mentioned earlier, are we who we say we are when nobody's looking? Are we in integrity with our own values? Do we show up the way we mean to show up for ourselves, for others, for our organizations, for our movements to end violence? And do we, um, how hard are we trying? I think this work is really hard because it's in the heart. And it requires us to practice all the time. What we practice, we get better at. So I think our invitation is for you to practice together so that this movement for gender equity, for justice belongs to us. So yeah, here we go, uh, Audrey. Cherie, thank you so much. So we got to start with this amazing quote from the beloved Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. This quote crystallized for our team what the work is essentially about, love plus power. I'm going to take the time to read this quote. It should be honored that way. Power properly understood is the ability to achieve purpose. It is the strength required to bring about social, political, or economic changes. In this sense, power is not only desirable, but necessary in order to implement the demands of love and justice. One of the greatest problems of history is that the concepts of love and power are usually contrasted as polar opposites. Love is identified with a resignation of power and power with a denial of love. But what is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. We boil that down to one essential truth and we start with the unapologetic recognition that catalytic love is an intentional decolonizing act. 
So you see from the quote from Dr. King, how it resonated with us and our experience as people of color navigating structural racism, one form of structural oppression. Okay, Ashley, Janae. So before I go forward in uh, what'll be a brief presentation and sharing some learning and key points, I want us to reflect on what that quote may have brought up for you. So in the chat, I would love for you all to take a minute or two to answer the question in your work, who have you witnessed who regularly wields power fused with love? Some examples of that might be a welcoming first engagement with someone in need, truly listening, truly listening and responding to those as the representative Ayala Presley says, closest to the pain. Emphasizing the connection and compassion rather than protocol. Making meaning of data gathered rather than merely extracting data from people. Building self-determination in clients and customers rather than dependence on you or someone else. Power to or power with rather than power over stances in your engagements. So those are maybe some probes to help you comment. Let's take a few minutes and we'll come back. Just write in the chat, whatever comes to you. Yeah, Amanda, one of the reasons I have trouble calling myself an evaluator is because of the way so many do just what we say not to do. Come in and have our own questions, collect information from people, and then don't tell them what we found. Don't share. Don't process. Don't make meaning of with them. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Centering those communities and elevating them to lead and following their lead. Let's just take a few more minutes. I'm, I'm really interested in y'all's comments here. Creating space for students, yes. Yes, greening work. Recognize the importance of our, our earth and um, paying attention to our climate and our, and our, our, our land. Yes. Listen with your heart. Wow, we're gonna talk some about that a little later. Yes. Yes. <laughs> or having it, having what you're gonna say already in mind and somebody's talking to you, so you're not really listening. Just preparing to say what you have to say in response, right? Participatory evaluation work, yes. Disability justice work, yes. Well, thank you all for taking the time to share those comments. Those are excellent examples of how that quote around love plus power equals an antidote to oppression. Um, and uh, our path toward justice. Yes. Okay, let's 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 go ahead and move forward. So I have to respond to the title of this session. And it's a really good place for us to have a jumping off point. 
Um, composting shame, right? Okay, so one of the folks that impressed me the most with one of the simplest ways to understand the difference between two concepts that are often conflated, shame and guilt, is Brene Brown. Um, and in the resources, I'm going to share a link to a uh, interview with her that kind of breaks this down even more. But essentially what she says, and I'm sure many of you on this uh, call know this, um, but she says, shame is essentially about identity. And the message is, I'm a bad person. Guilt is about action. I did something bad. So for, for me and for my understanding, an important step in composting shame is to shift from a question of identity to one of action. Guilt's not fun, but at least guilt opens the door to action. When bad things happen on our watch, mistakes, hurts, sins of omission or commission, we can get really stuck if we conclude that's who I am. That's, that's just who I am. I, I, can't, I can't help it. Therefore, that is what I do. I'm a bad person. But don't we know that we all do regretful things and none of us is the worst thing we've ever done or the worst thing that was done to us. We are so much more than that, but that's just it. If we can move from a place of I'm a bad person to I did something bad or something bad happened to me, then we can move into the realm of action. And actions are about responses and choices, things we have much more control over. If I made a choice to do one thing, I can make different choices to do other things. And I can really only control my choices and my responses at the end of the day. This puts it in the realm of my power to change and make different choices. And that is the connection to the measuring love framework. For me and Cherie and our team, what we consider the overwhelming, when we consider the overwhelming nature of systemic structural oppression, racism, sexism, violence, and victimization, we know there's only so much we can do uh, other than sit in the middle of the floor and just be completely overwhelmed, right? The place we have the most control over is our own choices and actions. Being relatively privileged oppressed people, rather than dwelling in our victimization or even our survivor or perpetrator guilt, the question for us becomes, how can I make better choices so as not to be complicit with structural racism, but to disrupt it? Within my own space of the internalized oppression that's inside of me and the oppression that I'm witnessing in organizations, institutions, and systems and how they impact us, in my choices and actions, what can I do and for myself and with others who are oppressed? So that's the segue I want to make to the framework and spend a lot more time on the framework and how we um, operationalize that framework to help us in our quest to make better choices and better decisions toward better actions that lead us to love and power, right? So an important thing is that there are at least three opportunities for focusing on action, choices, change to disrupt, to disrupt structural oppression in the framework. Because remember the premise that I just mentioned is as people in situations, we are impacted by structural racism from the outside and we've internalized structural racism inside ourselves. 
that's the first place we need to start. When you're looking at these concentric circles, starting with self and like Cherie mentioned, a radical self-love where it starts with resisting those internalized messages that make me complicit in my own oppression. I'm not enough. I'm not as good as somebody else or as excellent in how I do what I do. I'm an imposter. Those kinds of messages that just cut our legs out from underneath us. Or I had to do what the rules said or the regulations said or the way I was taught to do it because I need that promotion or I don't want to get fired. Believe me, <laughs> I know all about what it feels like to be a person of color a woman working in a foundation and feeling the hypocrisy and all the accountability we held our grantees to while we were accountable for very little. But I digress. <laughs> the point here is that as challenging as it may be, sometimes we can make choices to act with more love and compassion toward ourselves and others. Actually, we must do that. So we see here, starting with more self-love, oh, just, just one minute back on the other slide, I'm sorry. So we see in this concentric circle diagram, we start with the self-love and we've listed a couple of ways that what that looks like. Self-love, conscious of how we're in integrity with our own values. Critical analysis of our thoughts and behaviors. Self-care is revolutionary acts of resistance. When we have our self loved, and we're working on that all the time, it's not one and done, it's a lifelong thing. But when we're in the practice of loving ourselves, then we're in a better position to love others in ways that help them love themselves better too and make for better relationships of mutual support and accountability when we love others with deep listening, compassion, understanding, forgiveness, chances to do over. And then moving out as we love each other, one to one, one to two, three to three, and we form a community of love as a practice, a community of practice of love and power. And we organize ourselves and develop leaders while we're developing ourselves, share our stories of success, our stories of challenges, spread vision and hope, and fight for material change. We become a powerful community of love and power. And at some point along that journey, as we continue to grow as this community of mutual support, respect, and accountability, we can become a catalytic force in the environment, in the ecosystem. Love fused with power to own our power and use it to demand better, to share power with or power to, and build power for collective liberation. That's the task. Okay, now we can go to the next slide. So this is one place, love in action, starting with self. Another opportunity the framework offers to us is to really consider the fact that one of the ways that white supremacy culture impacts us all is to elevate the way head knowledge just reigns supreme over any other kind of knowledge, intellect, logical positivism. If I can't count it, it isn't real kind of thing, right? I know that emphasis very well as a recovering evaluator, I call myself evaluator now. <laughs> but the point is, it's all about how well I talk, how well I write, how well I think, how well I count, how well I measure, um, to the almost to the exclusion of any other way of knowing. But we know better, don't we? We know that we know the world and our meaning in it through other channels, our heart, our feelings based on our senses and perceptions. We know in our guts, we have crap detectors. We know, some may write about this inconsistency, this hypocrisy, right? 
How can we pay more attention to our heart? How can we encourage others to do the same? And then there's the spirit realm, our intuition, our ways of knowing based on ancestral wisdom and lineage and culture. And if we believe in a God or some universal power, spiritual knowing, are we listening to that? Are we responding to that? Are we making space for it in our busy lives to help us to know what is true and what is good and what is right? Um, and then there's the body. The body is always giving us cues, right? About our physical health. And we ignore those cues at our peril. I know some of us know we, we go, 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 go. We work, 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 work until our body just quits on us one way or another. Hopefully not in some chronic, tragic way, but the stress, the ulcers, the fatigue, the depression, the, oh, uh, we, we know, right? The point is, not to throw out our mind thinking, of course we need to use our mind, but not to the exclusion of these other avenues of knowing that robs us of all the other ways that we know that knowledge comes and helps us in our connection one to another, even to ourselves. And as Sheree alluded to in the very beginning, and so did Ashley, a more holistic, wholehearted, experience of life. That's a second place of opportunity. How, what are the ways that we are letting our feelings, our intuition and spirit, our body inform us about what we know? Okay, the next slide, thank you. And then finally, this third opportunity, which as a evaluator, I very much appreciate this opportunity for paying attention to what we're learning as we uh, go about these different choices and actions and practices. And it, it's framed in a continuum that starts on the left from a place of unconscious incompetence. And I should say, this continuum is borrowed from Gordon, a psychologist in the 70s who put it out there, has been used many, many times over. Um, and it basically starts on the left to say, you know, we're in this world doing the best we can sometimes and we don't know what we don't know. This is an important stage uh, where, of unconscious incompetence, where, we're not willfully incompetent, we just are uh, because we're not aware. We're not conscious of our behaviors, our decisions, our choices, the fact that we are operating out of internalized oppression. But we can become conscious and oftentimes painfully so, we become conscious of these forces and, and their impact on us. The question is, do we desire to change, right? So that's a first point of making a choice. I'm conscious of this now, what am I gonna do about it? How can I become more competent in different choices and actions that are more aligned to my values, right? So we can move to a stage, that second stage of conscious incompetence. We still are, are trying to figure it out, making mistakes. We, we have some awareness, but not enough to really unlearn the old ways of being and doing to new ways of being and doing. But with practice, um, with vulnerability, with honesty, we can do that. We can become consciously incompetent and better and better the more we're willing to lean into making different choices and actions. To that next stage, number three, of conscious competence. Okay. So now we've done enough practice. We are unlearning the old ways and learning new ways. We're inviting the head, heart, and spirit in. We're loving ourselves and loving others and building that community of accountability with others who are doing the same. And we're building this 
practice of transformative love plus power. This is a space we'd like to be in much of the time, right, with others. And so that we can move to that fourth stage of unconscious competence, where we get to a point where we don't have to think about it anymore. It's habit. It's all the ways of knowing are invited in. We're more wholehearted and more whole in our knowing and in our engagement as instruments of love and power in the world. Um, and we're leading and we learn how to follow. Now, lest you think this is a stage one, two, three, four, and I'm done. No, <laughs> obviously no. This is very iterative and cyclical. We make mistakes. We have days where we're tired. We screw up. We go into different communities. We meet different people. So we move through these stages off and on. Important to be in community with others that we trust, that we know are on a similar journey um, because structural racism, structural oppression is always there, always impacting us. So how are we on the defensive and the offensive in its presence? Choosing to be a disruptor and not complicit with structural oppression in our actions, relationships, decisions, transforming ourselves from unconscious incompetence to unconscious competence. Okay, so let's go to, yes. This slide tries to pull it all together to say essentially that this framework is applicable to a variety of settings where intermediaries, practitioners, evaluators, funders, service providers, those are what I'm calling intermediaries and others who are intermediaries can engage with clients, consumers, customers, constituents, each other in more love and power. Starting with self, learning with others in community, and then as a force, collective force in the environment, focused on moving from unconscious incompetence to unconscious competence and being a disruptor of systemic structural racism using our whole selves, I see that the mind, heart, spirit, body needs to be on this slide as well. I will add it, but that's another important uh, component to this framework and its work. Okay, I know that was a lot. Um, so let's move to the next slide and let me ask you, let's pause and see, um, some reflections from you on what you've heard. Uh, could be a feeling, what came up for you in your mind, your body, your spirit. What did that feel like? Do you have a specific memory or story in brief that you could share? So let's use the chat and would love to see how you all are processing and experiencing in other ways. Uh, what came up for you as I described the opportunities for choices and change from the framework. Audrey, while, while we let people kind of think and, and put some reflections in the chat, I, you know, I told this when we told you this when we first talked about this, but the levels of love in the framework look a lot like the social ecological model, which is something that as prevention practitioners, we really use to think about how our work is impacting individual relationship, community and societal levels um, of our communities. And so I just like in my mind, I am like moving them together so that they overlap and so that those lessons about love at all of those levels can be infused in, in the way we approach our prevention work. Hmm. Accidental success, yeah. Yeah, 
Love that comment, Joe, unconscious competence, yeah. And how can we be more strategic and intentional is what we're, we're asking here. So it's not so happenstance, right? Well, let's move. Let's move on to a couple of examples I wanna share with you from our work last summer. I had the privilege, as I said, of, of introducing this framework to a young man named Justin Merrick at the Center for Transforming Communities. And he found some money to allow me to take this framework in community with five fabulous Black women who themselves are situated in different domains where they interact with constituents of different kinds. So I'm just gonna do two examples here and I'm gonna run through them quicker than I'd like to because their work should be honored. But last summer, Tamika Greer, the executive director of a community organizing organization called Memphis Artists for Change, decided to take this framework into her Juneteenth celebration in the park that she does every year. And this is where they do one-on-ones with people who come and socialize and you know, doing their one-on-one -on -one work that most uh, community organizing organizations do. But she framed the interactions with folks around how they would define their experience of love or lack thereof as they engage with people in various social services, criminal justice, health systems. Folks were asked, have you ever experienced love when interacting with these systems? If so, what did it look like? If not, how could it have looked? And then did the opportunity to show love, did you have the opportunity to show love? Did you? If yes, you know. So, and then how do you show love? These were the questions people were asked and, you know, there were some really wide ranging conversations. Next slide, please. And so in summary, what Tamika did with those questions and sharing the feedback she got through video clips and quotes and pictures was that community members expressed showing respect to individuals and their problems as a powerful way of demonstrating love. Respect, y'all. Not a lot to ask when I show up at the social services office or, or some, show me some respect. What does that look like? Here's some quotes on the bottom making space for people to have problems. People have problems. They're not problems, people have problems. Giving people information that they need. Not necessarily what you think, but what they need, right? Don't deal with me like I'm a criminal. People showing respect and concern, showing love by doing things from a positive perspective. Seeing me, showing empathy toward me, just because I'm in a difficult situation and believing that I have whatever it takes to deal with this situation and come out of it with some support. Not real difficult, right? But that's not the experience people said they had for the most part. Okay, so that's one example. Let's move to Brittany's, Brittany Boyd Bullock beautiful woman who's an artist, a fiber artist to be exact. She works with materials. She took this framework and she said, you know, I'm going to do this in the context of my work and I'm going to engage people in an artistic activity with me. And I'm going to do it at Tamika's Juneteenth in the Park celebration day. I'm going to have me a little kiosk and as people come and go, I'm going to invite people and we're going to create love as propaganda. <laughs> and essentially what she invited people to do is to create buttons. And on those buttons, she asked people to come up with a drawing, a saying, a word, something that they could put on a button that reminds them of love. Make two buttons, one they can keep, one they can give away. And I just want to give one example uh, where Brittany invited this nine-year-old girl up who was real curious about this. And the little girl said, you know, huh, when I think about love, I think about smiles and what smiles engender. Well, 
That's not what the little nine-year-old girl said. I'm paraphrasing. But, you know, I have this teacher at my school who I smile at her every day and she never smiles at me. And it makes me feel like she doesn't care about me. She doesn't see me. And you know what? I think I'd like to make some buttons with smiles on it and rainbows and maybe even the word smile. And I'll make one and I'm going to give it to her. And what happened was a little girl made those buttons. She made three, actually. One she could keep for herself. One she could give to someone at the park that day, some random person. And one she was going to take back to the teacher. And what happened with the random person at the park is exactly what the little girl is hoping happens with this teacher. And that is that when she gave the person the button, she got a big smile in return and a hug and a thank you and said, you know, thank you for that. That's wonderful. I'm going to wear this and I'm going to think of you. And so little small act, but this idea that we can express love through a simple button with a picture and a word on it and kind of brighten somebody's day. That's what that little girl came up with. So that's another example of how people just took this framework and took it into their own environment. So I want to move to a space where, let me summarize. Well, let me just keep going. Let's keep going. This just summarizes Brittany's thing. So here's some key questions we learned in our demonstration project last summer, where we start with ourselves and preparing ourselves as we have these engagements and we know we're gonna interact with people. These are the kinds of questions we wanna ask ourselves. How am I showing up in love and power? What do I know about the circumstances of my constituents? Amazing how sometimes we don't even really know how they're experienced. We look at the data, we understand the indicators of the neighborhoods, but have we listened to the stories? Do we really know people's experiences from their own words and stories? Do we even know the history of racism or sexism in an area? Hmm, we could do more, right, to know that. In what ways am I centering my constituent experiences and opportunities, rather than going in telling them what's true about their lives. What are they telling me? How am I lifting that? And how am I responding to what they're telling me and having that guide what we decide to do to support as an organization or me as a person? What is my offer? And how does it align with constituent interests, needs, and goals? Am I just going out there with well, this is what our organization does. You know, I mean, to some extent, that's what we have to do, but are we seeking alignment with what we have to offer and what people actually are interested in, aspire to, need? And then finally, what are partnership opportunities? Because we know we can't do it all. We have to be in honoring of what our partners can do in this movement, and then what we can do in mutual support to each other. So those are the five questions. Yes, and, and so maybe one person can bring your voice into the room and just give us a couple of the insights that came from your group and others of you can type in the chat. And if we have time, we'll invite someone else to do the same. And that person that started can put theirs in the chat because we want to get all this good information from you all. So who wants to be our first voice? Let us know what you talked about in your breakup. Stephanie, yay. Stephanie, I will ask, I will allow you to unmute. And for folks, um, if you want to unmute in the future, just raise your hand and we can unmute you. So and go ahead. Rest. Okay, I had the um, privilege of meeting with Amanda and her baby. and. Um, one thing that we talked about was how we are showing up in love and power. And I think it's more or less that in this work that we do, we have an aura where people, we, we just, we just walk in that aura, in that power, in that manner, in that movement. 
And that's why people gravitate to us, no matter where we are, in the grocery store, in the office, people, and, and we cited different um, stories where I was in the office one day and I would notice that oh, my coworker is having a bad moment and you're about to go into tears and I would have to go into crisis intervention with them. And I thank God for my, uh, my training. That's one thing. And then um, the circumstances. We all experience certain circumstances while doing this type of work that really affect us. And it, it's heartfelt and it's also heart-wrenching. And we have to also recognize that. And then constituents, we had a, I had a problem with that word and I think she shared it with me is I would say more like clients or people that we are working with because it sounds a little political to me. And so that's all I have to say. And now you can mute me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. And I see others are writing in the chat. That's fantastic. Um, does anyone else wanna share what you talked about in your group? We have time for at least one other. Share Caitlin. Hey, hey, yeah, yeah. Hi, sorry. I was now I'm just I was able to unmute. Unmute. Sorry. Um, I was in group four, and it was it was a really great group. We had such a good conversation. Um, and like two things really stuck out to me. Um, when we were talking, is just well, we really resonated with the first question and realizing how much we separate love and power because of the associations that we typically have with love, whether that be romantic or religious, it just seems so contrasting with power that like, I think all of us were just kind of like grappling with how we can bring that out of just this part of our world and like making that like everything, like the lens of, through which we're doing things. And then we also had the RPE director um, from Hawaii in our group. And so she shared a little bit about the spirit of Aloha law, which she actually puts into the contracts. And that, that was honestly just like wild to me because, you know, in Indiana, we don't have anything even remotely close to that. Um, but so that's really stuck out to me. And I love that that's part of like the culture and man, I wish we had something like that in Indiana. That's awesome. That invites us to think about maybe I'm uh, Ashley and Janae, I'm not trying to put y'all on blast, but maybe we can invite people to share some of these documents and tools and things that they do that help manifest love and power. Awesome. Absolutely. Maybe, maybe one more, one more share if anyone wants to. If not, I'll keep going. Anyone? Okay, we have some things in the chat and that's awesome. So let's wind this down and bring it to a close. So of, of what I shared today, I also want to kind of comprise that into a summary of key takeaways. And so let's, let's look at those words because the question is, so what, now what, right? So, for us, the Measuring Love Framework provides an invitation to be much more conscious of the effects of structural oppression on ourselves and others, on the ecosystem that reinforces oppression, and then to make choices to be complicit or disruptive, to make good trouble, as our beloved John Lewis said, uh, within that. So here are three key points, one with three sub points. <laughs> the first is that love plus power is the antidote to structural oppression. Now let me say quickly, Sheree and I are people talking about we got silver bullets, but wow, that's not a good turn of phrase anymore, is it? But basically what I'm saying is we're not people who say we have all the answers, but what we are hoping is that we're providing you with a framework, a container in which you can be more intentional and strategic in things you're already doing probably, right? But being more intentional about that. 
and seeing the power of that, not being apologetic for it, not shying away. Like when Stephanie was talking, we have an aura. We emanate this stuff. Let's be loud and proud about that emanation and not apologetic. I don't care what funder asks you, well, what does that mean? Tell them what it means. Okay. So the second point is we all must grow and change. We all are on this journey. Ideally, we can be on it in mutual support from unconscious incompetence to unconscious competence with other people who are on this journey with us and want to be in that kind of mutual accountability, to be instruments of love and power. Then there are three opportunities for transformation that this framework provides to us. Starting with self-love and cultivating that love in ourselves, out to others, in community, and then as a catalytic collective force in the movement for love and power in this system that we all are trying to navigate on a day-to-day -day basis. Secondly, embrace the truth seeking and expression from all of our experience, our head experience, our heart experience, our spirit and our body as an all encompassing holistic presencing of ourselves. And then third, centering those folks who are most impacted by oppression in our movement toward the beloved community. If we can be intentional and strategic in these three ways, and there are other ways too, no doubt, but these three ways can help us be more in line with that alignment that Cherie spoke about in the first session of our values with our actions, with who we say we are, and cultivate that love and power that's so necessary for not only our survival, but our thriving. Okay, next slide. So my final call to action or invitation to you all based on this presentation is, what's just one way you could focus so that you can shift from being complicit to being disruptive? to build love and power in your own work. Now, we just talked about that a little bit from the session, but what I want you to do now is just maybe commit to just one thing that you're gonna think about doing and doing on your journey in your work. And maybe share in the chat if you feel so inclined, that one thing. And as you're sharing, I'll just um, invite my fabulous partner, Cherie, in for any last words of wisdom. I see her as that, wow, that person I'm always listening to. And then we'll turn it back over to Ashley and Janae to close. Cherie, dear sister. Wow, Audrey, thank you. Uh, my heart is pumping. It's so much loving gems in this session. I think one comment um, that uh, sister made about the Aloha principles and how we wish we could have that in Indiana. We can. Yes, we can and we must, right? Beg, borrow, or steal uh, with permission and with values alignment, who makes up these policies? People do, we do. And this comment in chat, right? We're not used to thinking about our own power. So we leave a lot of power on the table unconsciously. So I want to invite all of us 
to own our power, the power that we do have. In every room you're in, when you speak up, when you represent everything that you are about, rise with you. And yes, we can have it in Indiana too. If we can have it in Ohio, we certainly can have it in Indiana and all over this, this world. Thanks, Audrey. I'm gonna send it back to Ashley and uh, Janae to help us close. Oh, thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Sheree. Um, and thank you all so much for sticking in being willing to go into those breakout rooms and have conversations. I joined one today because I was just like, why, why not? <laughs> like, I, this is, this is my work too. So just thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Um, just a, a real quick reminder to our RPE and Delta recipients. You can invite subrecipients to the third session um, and, and honestly, your invitation is the only way they will get that information because this is not publicized on our website. Um, so please, if, if you know you have subrecipients that you think would benefit from this, please, please, please feel free to invite them. Um, if you haven't registered for the third and final session, it's about lies and lies and lies we tell, please, uh, we would love to see you there. Um, we will go ahead and, and uh, send you a follow-up email with a link to a, an evaluation survey and a certificate of attendance, as well as the link to the recording and the slides from this session. Um, and we are just so grateful once again to you, Audrey and Cherie, for leading us through in this journey and sharing all of your wisdom and your love with us today. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Janae, uh, any any closing thoughts from you? I don't think so. I, you know, I mentioned in the chat, if you have resources or things you would like to learn more about, please put them in the chat or you can email us. We can create downloadable follow-up documents to stuff like this. We'd love to. Um, we are also, as I mentioned, doing a podcast on love and bringing love into prevention. And I don't know if the RP director from Hawaii is here, uh, but if you're interested, I would love to chat with you and learn more. Um, we'll also be publishing follow-up learning opportunities on our social media. So make sure that you're following us on social media. And thank you, Audrey, Cherie, Ashley, and everyone who was here appreciate you all. I am going to stop sharing and close the web conference. So if you get moved to the waiting room, that just means the web conference is over. We're going to do our presenter debrief. So that's why we're doing that. But thank you all and we will see you soon.